Well, I certainly think the future of Christianity is going to be ecumenical. That, that the more I, I work, the more I see that every denominational tradition, every lineage, uh, is holding a pearl of great price, sometimes two or three pearls of great price. And we would be just at a tremendous loss not to recognize that, include that, honor that. Um, which means, in a certain sense, our, our preoccupation with our individual church politic is not going to have to be dismissed. That would be low-level consciousness. But have to be lessened uh, be, because there's bigger questions to be asked that for one reason or another, each individual denomination in its present church politic doesn't seem to be able to answer. Um, so, is that what we mean or what some of us mean by the emerging church? It's something that is grounded in tradition and in a lineage, if I can use that word, and yet still operates around that. And I'm not trying to talk about relativism or skepticism, but I think grounded in faith, grounded in even orthodoxy, what Brian McLaren calls a generous orthodoxy. I, I certainly think that's the future. And you know, as you even look at the coming together of the continents, uh, like, for example, what I was trying to teach today, non-dual thinking, I consciously met much less resistance to that from Asian peoples. You know? they, just like they get it much easier, you know? They get, or our gay people will often get non-dual consciousness because it's written in their very being somehow. If, if we can draw all this from different groups, uh, I know that sounds scary, but that's the only future I think that is going to have credible Jesus witness. I go back to uh, our favorite Jesuit, Carl Rahner. I think I'm quoting it exactly. He said, in the days ahead, you'll either be a mystic or nothing at all. In times of uh, persecution, <clears throat> in times of radical uh, re-examination of the authenticity of Christian doctrine, I really relate to this, that I'm going to have to rely on my own personal experience of Jesus, of uh, the triune God, and I see in the days ahead, numerically, the Christian community is going to ex experience enormous loss. We're going to be numerically uh, so much a smaller community than we ever have been in the past. And I don't think that's a bad thing, because while we call ourselves a Christian nation, I don't think in reality uh, as Richard has written in one of his books, what do we do with the avarice, the greed that is consuming our country? Uh, in the days ahead, I think we're going to have much smaller communities. We're going to have little core communities like the CAC that Richard started. And I think it'll be a community of mystics who have actually experienced Jesus. And that experience of Jesus leads to uh, activity in the Christian community where we've got to bear witness uh, to others. So I see a very positive future. Uh, I'm interested in, in the idea of the shrinkage because it seems to me that's happened in Europe, certainly, and it's happened in, in England, not least happens where, where I work that uh, where there were quite thriving Christian communities, churches are being shut, some denominations are cutting their budgets drastically. Um, we in the Anglican Communion, in the Anglican Church, sorry, in, in England, have not ordained uh, year on year as many priests have, as have retired year on year for many years now. So our, our base of, of um, ordained ministry has shrunk 
And some people say that's great because it empowers the lay people. I think that can be a council of despair. You know, we just we would love to have more priests. Actually, we just haven't got them at the moment. We 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 may be turning the corner on it. But simultaneously, um, Christianity is enormous in many other parts of the world, and uh, Christianity has blossomed and flourished in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia. Um, sometimes in forms that uh, I would hardly recognize, let alone approve of with my conscious, critical, you know, normal, rational mind. But there are people out there who are naming the name of Jesus, who are praying in, in the power of the triune God. And even if they look a bit different from me, it seems to me these are my sisters and brothers, and I have to celebrate that. And I think that actually this may be a way in which God is um, leading the way uh, to transform the hegemony of the Western world into something totally mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And if the Christian yeah. gospel leads to that, uh, hallelujah, that's fantastic. It ought to be the case, if Jesus really is Lord, that it will be through people naming and serving Jesus that the world is transformed, even if it means that our bit of the world, which has been the kind of field leader in so many things for so long, actually are the ones scratching our heads in the rear and saying, funny, well, what's this all about? But to come back to what you said, I mean, the, the ecumenical imperative, I think, is, is, is just obvious now. Oh. And the good news is that a large number of people across the different traditions get it. Mm -hmm. And they know in their bones mm -hmm. that we belong together and that it's frustrating that you and I can't share the Eucharist together officially. Um, but we will get there. I, I believe we'll get there. Mm -hmm. What I see, though, is that uh, the secular dream has run out of steam. That wasn't meant to rhyme, it just happened. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, yes, right. um, that uh, yeah, the secularist myth, which journalists in Britain still live by, I don't know about elsewhere, is that religion is shrinking, it's, it's in its death throes, so it's very dangerous at the moment, so we have to rubbish it, hence Richard Dawkins and people and the vitriol that you spoke of. Um, the journalists actually, if they'd been right, Christianity should have shrunk to zero by about now, more or less. <coughs> if they've been right over the last 30 years or so. And the fact that we haven't, that we haven't gone away, and that we have, in some cases, thriving and energetic churches, and that the science and religion paradigm, which the Templeton Foundation is, is, is exploring, is actually alive and active and positive and throwing up new things all the time, th this doesn't fit the map that people thought. And I see possibilities for a post-postmodern Christian faith which will look quite different to the modernist forms, including the liberal, liberal conservative standoff, which we still suffer from, and which will look different also to the postmodern form, which the emerging church has to live in because that's where we are that's at the true, moment. Yeah. But there will be something out beyond that. You can't, you can't um, put postmodernity on a pedestal and say, there we are, we've got it, because we're not modern anymore, this is where we've got to stay forever and ever. You can't live like that. We have to see ourselves as in transition to something different, something bigger, something certainly with the experience of God in prayer and, and sacraments and scripture and so on, absolutely central. But something in which the uh, false antitheses of intellect, um, emotion, uh, social activism, and prayer, etc., the, these have to be brought together so that it isn't playing them off against each other, but heart, mind, soul, and strength all together. And I see a great future for that but I'm afraid that we're going to have to go through some fire and water to get there. Mm. Which is what I was talking about the other night in relation to Acts, the shipwreck, that you know, you own, the gospel only gets to the place where it's going to reach the rest of the world if you're prepared to go through the shipwreck. And, uh, and that's not comfortable. We none of us like the sound of it. Mm.